Good evening. This is Every Creature Commission Television and the Restoration Programme. Greetings in the mighty name of Jesus. We welcome you to our program tonight. Over many, many weeks now, nearly a year, our cry has been for Elam to be restored. And we have gone through how the infiltrations came in. We believe uh, it's all of the New World Order. Now, don't get put off by that. We're not into conspiracy theory. We're into conspiracy fact or the deep state. Now, in the Bible, they're mentioned, but listen to this. The Bible is clear over the God of this world. The Bible is clear that even now, many antichrists have come, and the Bible is clear on the signs of the times, and the kingdom of the Antichrist is coming. Within this process has come the taking over of evangelical Pentecostal movements. We've been covering this and proving this for nearly a year. And we're here tonight in the precious name. Oh, thank you, Father, for thy anointing as we covered these matters. Now, in Albert Edson's book, Set Your House in Order, we have chapter 11, Members of Jeffrey's Family as I Have Known Them. We're going to be going through that tonight. But as a start from Healing Rays, um, there's a recording here in this book of... A Q&A session, and just one question is very interesting. As the epistle of James question was written to the 12 tribes scattered abroad, is it correct to say that the promise of healing in the fifth chapter was exclusively for them and not for the church today? And George Jeffries in the anointing, thank God for the life of George Jeffries. Peter's epistle begins thus. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered through Pontius. Pontius is today's European side of Istanbul. Galatia, the Asian side of today's Istanbul, formerly Constantinople. Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. John writes to an elect lady and Paul to the saints that be in Rome. Now, by the same line of reasoning, one must conclude that these epistles, if exclusively so addressed, are not applicable to the Christian church of the 20th century. And further, it suggests that the church of today has no right to appropriate scriptures from any other epistle at all. For there is not a single epistle addressed to the church of Christ in the 20th century. But the Church of Christ, declared Jeffreys, consists of all who are born of the Spirit of God in every age. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. And the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins... They shall be forgiven him. James 5, 14 to 15. What an introduction to our program. Oh, Father, thank you for this thy word today, that we can grasp thy word as just as relevant for today as it was yesterday and will always be till thou comest again in the sky for thy church. Oh, Father, thank you for these great promises we can stand on. Thank you for the great ministry, great because of thee, of George Jeffries. And we give Jesus the praise and all the honor. Reading now from Albert Edsus, Set Your House in Order, Chapter 11. Declared Edsa, because of my intimate association with Principal George Jeffries, I came to know other members of this remarkable family. I begin by referring to his eldest brother, Pastor Stephen Jeffries, some 12 years his senior, so greatly used as pastor and evangelist in South Wales, 
and in other parts of our country, as well as in America, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, and South Africa, and whom I first met in 1933. Stephen administered with his brother George in South Wales with great effect before the formation of the Elam movement by the latter in 1915. They were together in Elam for a few years in the early 1920s, either working together or separately in revival and healing campaigns and conventions. Among other activities, there were the outstanding campaigns in Grimsby and Hull in 1922, conducted by the brothers, followed by visits that year to Goldswill, Switzerland, with a great baptismal service being held at Bern in the River Ur, then to Italy with others which included seeing the Colosseum, Catacombs and Vatican in Rome, and passing along the Appian Way. 1923 saw visits to Sweden, Germany and Holland with joint ministry at times of which foreign tour George Jeffries wrote if it cannot help deepen our lives, broaden our minds and inspire us to attain greater things for our Lord in the homeland. In 1924 Stephen and George Jeffries shared in the ministry in the extensive four months tour of Canada and America being enthusiastically received and greatly used. After Stephen had been with his brother as aforesaid, which also meant joint ministry and conventions in Northern Ireland, and with him becoming a member of the Council of the Elam Pentecostal Alliance, with which is incorporated the Elam Evangelistic Band already formed in Ireland, this announcement appeared in the Elam Evangel, Volume 5, December 1924. Our readers specifically requested to pray for a campaign that is to be held in the public hall Barking London, commencing January the 18th, now entirely in evangelistic work for the Elam Alliance. He resigned his charge as pastor of Dowlice Church, South Wales, on Sunday, November 2nd, when crowded congregations attended the closing service of his pastorate. This campaign commenced as stated being the forerunner of the revival and healing campaign meetings of 1925-26 to 26, conducted by the brothers in the East End of London and elsewhere in the capital and which went on for months. There were great initial results of barking, the campaign being followed on there by George Jeffries with reported increasing power and spiritual momentum, and with him then carrying the revival fire to East Ham, which speedily took a firm hold, we are told, of the whole district. The brothers ministered together in the Surrey Tabernacle in Wansey Street, near the Elephant and Castle, a building comparable in size to C.H. Spurgeon's original tabernacle in the same area. The Surrey Tabernacle saw further scenes of revival power and blessing, with great crowds in attendance daily. Hundreds of converts were immer baptized by immersion in water, and there were mighty miracles of healing in these meetings, which are still talked about by people I know today who were there. Bear with me, we just have a technical issue here with our equipment I'm just fixing. Just let me press a few buttons and then I'll be right with you. If you just joined us, welcome to the Restoration Program. We're reading through Set Your House in Order by Albert Edser, who's giving account of the family of George Jeffries. We love you being here. It's a great honor you should be with us. Just seeing that our our equipment is actually working, which it isn't. <laughs> Let's bear with us now. Just bear with us now. Welcome back. We had an interruption there. Praise the Lord, the recording. 
recordings have been kept and we're so pleased you've joined us back again. We're reading through Set Your House in Order by Albert Edser, the pianist and secretary of George Jeffries, of days of old of the 1920s, of the family of George Jeffries and how George and Stephen worked together. Other notable campaigns were held individually by them at this time as such places as Hendon, North London. Yes, we're still recording, praise the Lord. Forest Hill in London's southeast Cannon Town. Ilford and Plasto in the East End. And even during the general strike of 1926, God was moving in mighty fashion in that vast area despite the adverse conditions with conversions and healings in evidence on every hand there were ugly scenes too as striking workers were on the streets overturning cars in their bitterness mr dara told me that as george jeffries and party were approaching canning town bridge en route to their revival meeting men made forward with disintention when a woman cried out don't touch that car that's the divine doctor they went through unharmed and as a result of these campaigns a number of elam tabernacles were opened by george jeffries in the east end of london the brothers were totally different in style and demeanor. Stephen, by all accounts, having a flamboyancy that was exhilarating, and George with a dignified seriousness which had no need to admit of any change of style. Stephen was essentially a preacher of the gospel, an evangelist, whereas George's evangelistic ability was coupled with that of Bible teacher and expositor. God in his infinite wisdom. We're just getting more warnings on there. I, I, I'm telling you this. We're going to get through this program. We're going to be reading all of this. I can tell you that. Just bear with us. We're reading Albert Edson's Set Your House in Order. We welcome you in the name of the Lord. God bless you. We're reading through about George Jeffrey's family at this time about how both George and Stephen operated right it, I'll, I'll, I'll start from the top of page 143 praise the lord stephen was essentially a preacher of the gospel an evangelist whereas george's evangelistic ability was coupled with that of bible teacher and expositor god in his infinite wisdom chose both with their own particular personalities and avenues of service and made them channels not only of his supernatural power in the salvation of thousands of souls, but in the propagating of fundamental Pentecostal truths. Hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. Propagating fundamental Pentecostal truths leading to the establishing of churches which have stood to this day. In this we see God who is no respecter of person, using these two brothers in the 20th century, brought up in humble circumstances, the elder taken from his heavy work in the coal mine and the younger from his less arduous duties as a shop salesman, contrasted by his use of two brothers in the 18th century, John and Charles Wesley, raised in a completely different environment and Oxford educated as they were. 1926 saw the departure of Stephen Jeffries from Elam and by 1933, when I first met him, he was well established with assemblies of God in this country. His exceptional evangelistic gifts being at their disposal in memorable campaigns and conventions. When campaigning in the skating rink at Scarborough in 1933, we drove up to Sunderland to see, meet Stephen, then 57, who was holding forth there Frankie Allen, known as the boy preacher, whom Stephen knew was with us. We arrived at the house, and I may say it was with much anticipation I had looked forward to this moment. 
and after standing at a respectable distance in the room as Stephen welcomed his brother and Frankie, I was greatly amused to hear myself being nonchalantly introduced to him as, this is Edsor. I picked him up at Brighton about five years ago. Praise the Lord. Undoubtedly, these two greatly used brothers as pioneers created church congregations for other evangelists and preachers and their gospel ministry. In the next 10 years of Stephen Jeffrey's life, the last years of which saw him weak in body but as strong as ever in spirit, I accompanied George Jeffreys on numerous occasions to Brintelic, Stephen's home on the Neath Road by Stage, South Wales, where we had fellowship with him, his wife Elizabeth Ann, and daughter May, afterwards Mrs. Llewellyn. Stephen became a minister in the Bible Pattern Fellowship after its formation in 1940. And in November 1943, owing to a severe cold, George Jeffries did not travel from London to attend the brothers' impressive funeral service at Mass Day, much as he desired to be there to pay his last earthly tribute to one who had been so signally used of God, it was my privilege to attend on his behalf. Brian Mason and I have stood at his grave in my stay, thanking God for his life and his example, praying in the name of Jesus that this be used even now in the 21st century to God's glory and to God's delight. Oh, praise you, Lord Jesus, for giving us the life of Stephen Jeffries, who is honored here in this wonderful book, Set Your House in order. After the service at the church, we sang our final farewell at the graveyard in the old Langonworth Cemetery nearby as he was laid to rest with his wife, who had predeceased him by almost three years. One of the many wreaths bore the words, looking for that blessed hope, loving sympathy from his fellow ministers of the Bible pattern church fellowship under the heading and inspiring vision principal george jeffries wrote and published in the pattern at the time bear with me i've just got some a technical difficulty to sort out here i'm just sorting that out now praise the lord yes we're back with you now uh, getting better sound quality if you just join us we're reading through set your house in order by albert edser and we have been looking yes over the last nearly the last year at george jeffries and what happened with elam the infiltration of the god of this world and now we're reading a delightful chapter written by albert edser in relation to george jeffries brother who had been buried at my stay. Under the heading, a tribute here. An inspiring vision, Principal George Jeffries wrote and published in the pattern at the time. In our heart-to-heart -heart talks during latter years, my beloved brother, Pastor Stephen Jeffries, and I often expressed mutual regret that we had not seen the full scriptural vision of free self-governing churches right from the beginning of our God-given ministries. Had we and others who were called of God to serve as pioneers and leaders in the Pentecostal movement seen the vision of the one body with its members gathered together in free self-governing churches as our dear Pastor Louis Petrus of Sweden? Are we still on? One, two. Bear with us. <laughs> Bear with us. Dear brother and sister, we're reading through Albert Edsa's book, Set Your House in Order. We're having some technical difficulties, but we're getting through in the name of the Lord Jesus. If you just bear with me a moment and trying to prevent these interruptions from occurring, I think I've achieved that now. Welcome back. Set your house in order. We've just been reading through a tribute by George Jeffries, and now we're dealing with the issue of the self-governing churches, which was the heart of both Stephen and George Jeffries, denied him in Elam 
which was founded by George Jeffries. Had we and others who were called of God to serve as pioneers and leaders in the Pentecostal movement seen the vision of the one body with its members gathered together in free, self-governing churches as our dear Pastor Louis Petrus of Sweden had seen it, the history of the Pentecostal movement in the British Isles would have been vastly different. There would have been one great Pentecostal movement instead of the various sections. Pentecost has demonstrated it is far too big for sectarian frontiers and that its leaders clothed with power and graced with gifts are called to fields of service far beyond the narrow confines of one particular sect. Desires expressed in those heart-to-heart -heart talks were laid before our Lord in prayer. Had it been our Heavenly Father's will to miraculously restore my dear brother to health, how it would have rejoiced my heart to have had him at my side, boldly declaring this full scriptural vision of freedom for God's people. But it has pleased God to take him, and we can say, Thy will be done. It's the privilege of those who remain to go on winning souls for Christ, and after winning them, to teach them to conform to the scriptural pattern of Holy Ghost churches, free from the bondages of organized religion. What should we not be willing to sacrifice to see the sectarian wars disappear in Pentecost and the greater Pentecostal revival come? Stephen's son, Edward Jeffries, FRGS, his wife, son and daughter, naturally came into our orbit as is another member of the gifted family of preachers, that is, William Jeffries and his family. Edward was used for some years in Pentecostal revival and healing campaigns in our land and the establishing of churches under the Bethel Evangelistic Society he founded. Both he and his uncle William, brother of Stephen and George, were ministers with the Bible Pattern Church Fellowship. Then, quite unknown to his uncle George and following the death of his father, Edward negotiated with Elam headquarters for the sale of the Evangel Temple Church building at Southport to Elam and gave them his own life story of his father for publishing by the Elam Publishing Company at Clapham, London. He wrote of this to his sister May while she was on a visit to their uncle George and ministering to him in London to her distress in his hurt in the circumstances of the Elam disputation. Such resulted in a number of regrettable misleading inclusions and omissions of essential facts when the book appeared in 1946. As Noel Brooks has written, amongst other things, of this episode in his book, Fight for the Faith and Freedom. Why did Edward Jeffries react so drastically from the Bible Pattern Church Fellowship, of which he had been a minister, and sell the Evangel Temple Southport to Elam? And why did his book omit such significant facts and lead himself so conveniently to bolster up the centrally controlled Elam movement, the principles of which were poles apart from those held by his deceased father. It would be futile for one mortal to attempt to plumb the depths of another mortal's soul or to assess the motives that govern his behavior. Edward was well aware of the article and inspiring vision as given in this chapter. Ultimately, Edward Jeffreys became a minister in the Church of England in the Chelmsford Diocese. The last time I saw him was at his uncle's funeral service at Kentington Temple in London in 1962. George Jeffreys had borne no antagonism towards him. On the contrary, he'd been kindly received with his family at his uncle's house once the matter, although unredeemable, had been dealt with between them. I saw three of George Jeffrey's sisters, Margaret, Emily, and Chrisley. Their husbands and families in the Mystag area of South Wales, especially Chrisley, the youngest, with whom we would stay in the little home on Neath Road, Mystag. 
In 1987, I had an interesting correspondence with Mr. Glyn Thomas, a nephew, about Kezia Jeffries, mother of the three Jeffries brothers and their nine sisters and brothers, six of them, six of whom, like her first and second husbands, predeceased her between the years 1879 and 1916. <laughs> In Glynn's warm appraisal of his granny Jeffries, he pictured her as being one of a generation of good, upright folk whose principles would, no, would not tolerate compromise. I saw in this something of the same strong character in George Jeffries, the son I was most intimate with for so long. What a wonderful chapter. We've got more personal glimpses and contacts of Albert Edser, uh, next week, we thank you so much. And just leaning over now to get our closing music ready. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Oh, what a wonderful chapter that has been. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And we thank you for joining us tonight. It's been a wonderful time with the Lord, despite of our technical issues with the equipment. We're praising the Lord you've been with us. Oh, Father, I pray the anointing of God upon all watching this program. That, Father, we pick up this mantle of George Jeffries. That we move on with it. We declare the movement of Elam free from the bondage of central control. And restore it back into the hearts of the people. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us. We love you. God bless you. We'll see you again soon. We've loved it tonight. God bless. <laughs>